So welcome to the last lecture by Professor Wiskin. Right. So uh, I want to use the last lecture to give you some more further results and an overview in what directions uh, these um, mean curvature flows could be useful. And uh, one theme I thought might be interesting to <coughs> many of you is how one can use mean curvature flow to prove some isoparametric inequalities. So this lecture is about applications. And the isoparametric inequalities. And uh, <clears throat> let's, to, to fix ideas, let's do first a one dimensional case and show you the most complicated proof of the isoparametric inequality you've ever seen. It's not complicated if you know mean curvature flow, of course. So, <clears throat> given an initial curve, gamma zero, S1 into R2, so gamma zero of S1 is the boundary of our initial domain that we are interested in. And then we know by Grayson's theorem that there exists a solution gamma on some maximal time interval into R2 of um, <coughs> curve shortening flow. And uh, this uh, takes this complicated curve into, it remains embedded, and it takes it into a small circle and then to a point. So uh, gamma t converges <coughs> to convex round circle, shrinking round circle as t goes to t max. And uh, if you want to study isoparametric problem, we need to know how the uh, length and um, area uh, evolve. So let L of t be the, in the, the length of the curve and uh, A of t, the area of the domain enclosed at time t. And then we get ddt of the length is it's our old formula about the volume element. And ddt of the area is uh, <coughs> the integral of the uh, speed along the curve. And uh, this is, of course, the integral of the geodesic curvature. And for a closed embedded curve, we know that this is a minus 2 pi. So in fact, uh, we know uh, in the one dimensional case that t max, because the area is decreasing linearly, and at the end it is going to be 0. So the uh, maximal time must be the initial area divided by 2 pi. Okay. And we know at the end, both of them tend to zero. So let's look at what the isoparametric distance, the isoparametric defect, if you like, does under the flow. This is what is supposed to be positive on the initial surface, but we, let's pretend we don't know that. And then let's just compute under the flow this is minus 2L times integral k squared because of the formula above. And from here we get plus 8 pi squared. Now just use Schwarz inequality and then you get that this is less than minus 2 times the integral of k ds squared. 
plus 8 pi squared. But integral k ds is 2 pi. If you square that, you get 4 pi squared, so this is 0. In other words, this isoparametric defect decreases under the curve shortening flow. And since L of t <coughs> and A of t by Grayson's theorem, so here I use heavily Grayson, tend to 0 as t tends to t max. It must be, since it's been decreasing, that initially it was positive. So we conclude that at the beginning, we must have had this inequality, which is the isoparametric inequality. In other words, the isoparametric inequality in the plane is a trivial consequence of Grayson's theorem. Now, it turns out you can try to do that now in higher dimensions. So let's, let's just do the same thing. All right, so we, we know that we, because of scaling, we should take the power n plus 1 over n of the area of the surface at time t. And then we know there is this optimal constant that we expect from the sphere, from the round sphere. We know how much uh, this should be times the volume enclosed by the surface. And now we just do the same computation. We just we get here minus n plus 1 over n times the area to the uh, 1 over n times integral, now it's the mean curvature squared, d mu. And from here, we get plus c0 times the integral of the mean curvature, d mu, over the surface. OK. And now, <coughs> you see, we <coughs> want to compare the positive term with the negative term. We hope that the negative term wins. So what can you do? You do Schwarz inequality, like, just like before. So we estimate this <coughs> from uh, below by minus n plus 1 over n times uh, the measure to the 1 on n. And from the Schwarz inequality, I get a minus 1 half. And here I get the integral of um, h squared uh, <coughs> d mu to the one half, um, and then uh, and I can take this whole thing plus c zero times integral h d mu. Okay. So I've taken one half of this, one, one, the square root of this, estimated from below by integral h, and the other square root stays here. Right? And uh, <coughs> now you see, everything is fine. <coughs> so it turns out that the um, in the convex case, if you have convex surfaces, there's some kind of Minkowski inequality, well-known inequality that says that the integral of h d mu over the boundary of a domain is bigger than, and the constant in the Minkowski inequality relates to the constant c0 by n over n plus 1 c0 times mn to the n minus 1 over n. So this is well known for convex surfaces. And then, of course, this means we can, using again Hölder, we can estimate integral h squared d mu to the 1 half uh, from below by uh, n 
over n plus 1 times this constant times mn to the, um, and now here I have to subtract 1 half, so I get 1 half minus 1 on n um, as the power, and therefore I, you know, this, these constants here obviously perfectly fit what stands here, and I get again that this is less or equal to zero. So I get again the <coughs> isoparametric inequality because there's this theorem that I proved a long time ago that the convex surfaces shrink to a point just like <coughs> in the one dimensional case. So this gives you a <coughs> proof, an immediate proof of the isoparametric inequality for convex regions in Rn plus 1, okay? Since uh, convex surfaces, convex surfaces smoothly contract to a point. Now, of course, these inequalities are well known. You don't need this particular proof, but you have now a new method, and you can hope to apply this method maybe in more general situations, maybe in Riemannian manifolds, <coughs> assuming some curvature conditions. Um, the first step, of course, would be to try, in the higher dimensional case, to extend this proof beyond surfaces that are convex. And also in Riemannian manifolds, convexity is such a strong assumption, you want to do this uh, in a more general setting. So <coughs> the question is, can one extend this from convex to some other class, for example, to the class of positive mean curvature surfaces? That would be great because usually it's enough to prove the isoparametric inequality for positive mean curvature surfaces because if you have a general domain, you can always take the mean convex hull, which has no negative mean curvature, and then you could start, and that um, <coughs> is then better in terms of the isoparametric inequality anyway because it has the same area and uh, <coughs> has the, or even less area, and it has more volume. So you can usually start with the mean convex hull uh, to prove the isoparametric inequality, and therefore the question is, can you extend this argument to surfaces of uh, non-negative mean curvature? Now, we know that in that case, however, we have uh, possibly singularities. All right, we could have this uh, neck pinch. Now, in the neck pinch, you have this long cylinder. So certainly, if you were just to cut out this neck, if you just, could just cut out this neck and replace it, some cap, this would certainly improve the isoparametric situation. So if we could show somehow that only this or essentially this thing happens and we could extend by cutting out this neck, then we have a chance to extend this mean curvature flow proof of isoparametric inequalities to a more general setting. So the task will be try to extend the mean curvature flow beyond singularities. Now, in general, in very high dimensions, it is known that the singularities can be terrible. So if n is greater or equal than 3, <coughs> singularities may occur on sheets which locally look like say S, S1, S, S1 cross 
R2, or more general, Sn minus K cross Rk. Now, if K is bigger than 1, in other words, if you have more than one flat direction and you have really a whole sheet, two-dimensional or higher-dimensional sheet of spheres shrinking off, which can happen, I just can't draw it, um, we just don't know what to do, how to do the surgery. There is still a concept of weak solution that, uh, for example, Professor Tonegawa told you about with level set approach, but certainly the smooth approach that I'm choosing here and doing explicit surgery is completely hopeless in that case, at least for the time being. <coughs> no technology for surgery available yet. So we have to somehow concentrate on the point where you have just one such neck and where this cross-section here is like as n minus 1 cross r. And uh, Carlo will tell you a little about how this works in dimensions greater or equal than 3, if you find a way to restrict to this case. What I want to do is concentrate on the case n equals 2. So the plan now is what can be done for two surfaces in R3 or in a general Riemannian manifold N3 G bar if the mean curvature is positive and the surface is embedded and the initial surface Carlo will tell you what you can do in higher dimensions if you have a stronger positivity condition to convexity for the surfaces, but there you don't need embeddedness. So here I'm not going to speak about some, and this is joint work with Simon Brentle. Uh, I think we finished this in 2016, and this is appearing as partially has, has appeared in Inventiones and another part is going to appear in the Journal of the European Mass Society. Uh, but this is uh, 2018. Okay, so <coughs> we want to look at uh, two-dimensional embedded surfaces in the Riemannian 3-manifold and uh, assume positive mean curvature. Now, this allows, of course, these singularities. And the first thing we have to do is we have to classify the singularities. We have to know exactly what singularities are possible. We could do this in the one-dimensional case. Remember, Grayson's theorem, we, class, we said the only possi possible singularity for embedded curves in R2 is the shrinking sphere. So now here, because of this picture, and because, remember, this degenerate problem, I was drawing this situation where the surface would develop a cusp. And uh, here, you expect somehow this, in the limit, to be sort of this shrinking circle. And I said here, you expect it somehow to be such a convex thing, which is attached to a cylinder. So we have to, and then of course you have still have the shrinking spheres. So we want to prove that essentially these are the only possibilities. And uh, to do that, one tool is something I just throw at you without proof. Carlo may say more about this is, and this is a general theorem. This is joint of uh, Carlos Sinistrari and myself a while back. So we're using a convexity result. If the initial surface, 
is in any dimension <coughs> is <coughs> or has positive mean curvature. Then for any eta, there exists a constant C eta, which just depends on the initial surface and um, maybe on the time interval where the solution exists. Uh, and on the ambient Riemannian manifold, so this is really quite general. Such that the smallest principal curvature, or any principal curvature, is bounded from below by just a tiny negative fraction of the mean curvature, and then uh, possibly this big constant C of eta. But the scaling invariant part in the inequality only has an arbitrarily small fraction on the right-hand side. So the negative, the negative eigenvalue that may be there is tiny near the singularity compared to the mean curvature, so that in particular when you rescale, the negative part goes completely away, such that any rescaling of a singularity uh, <clears throat> must be weakly convex, must be a weakly convex <coughs> solution of mean curvature flow in Rn plus 1. Because even if you do this in a Riemannian manifold, during the rescaling, since the Riemannian manifold has bounded curvature, after rescaling, you just see the tangent space of the Riemannian manifold, which is Rn plus 1. So the singularity models will always live in Euclidean space, even if your surface happens to be in a Riemannian manifold. And of course, you see how this, at least this is the first step towards this picture, right? So even though we start here with something only mean convex, if this singularity happens after rescaling, we see the shrinking cylinder, which is weakly convex. And if we are in this situation here, we even get something which is strictly convex. And if we are in the case where we shrink to a sphere, also we are in the case of strictly convex. So this is just saying that we cannot have limits that are completely non-convex. Okay? Not going to say anything uh, about the proof. It's uh, based on a analysis of the evolution equations for the curvature and the mean curvature and a lot of analysis at p estimates, Mosa iteration um, <coughs> to do this. Now, the, what you can do with that in the two-dimensional case is the following. So suppose M20 is sitting in a smooth <coughs> Riemannian 3 manifold and embedded and a positive mean curvature. Oh. Then the only rescalings of singularities that may occur are the following. First, you see S2 shrinking, the standard shrinking sphere in R3. The second possibility is you see S1 cross R shrinking, shrinking cylinder. And the third one is a <coughs> convex eternal solution. I should say strictly convex here, strictly convex eternal solution <coughs> at, with 
cylindrical end. So near infinity, it looks like number two. So it's, exact, so it's this picture. You rescale, you find a strictly convex part, and this strictly convex part is attached to something which gets more and more looking like a cylinder. <clears throat> so that's a classification of the rescalings that you can get. And then you have to work a little bit harder to show that uh, these rescalings fit together to give you a complete picture how the manifold looks in those regions where the curvature is big. Say, if you close to, the, to a singular time, <coughs> you can use this theorem to prove what is called a canonical neighborhood theorem. So from this theorem over there, I say something to the proof in a second. You prove another theorem, again with Simon. I call this canonical neighborhood theorem. And this says, given the initial surface as described, embedded positive mean curvature in the Riemannian manifold, there is a constant H0, some huge constant. This is just to indicate it's huge. Obviously, everything depends on the scaling. Um, <coughs> depending on the initial surface and the ambient manifold. Okay, sorry, I'm, yes, we are in dimensions two. Such that the region the mean curvature is bigger than that number, in other words, the almost singular region. I'm still talking about a completely smooth surfaces, right? These surfaces are, we are still below T max, but we may be very close to the singular time, and then we may have a region where the curvature is huge, and what I'm saying is you can determine a threshold for the mean curvature such that beyond this threshold, you know exactly how the manifold looks like. So there will, it will be like this. There will be a part of the manifold which is sort of completely <coughs> unknown to you. You just know it's embedded as positive mean curvature, and the cur mean curvature is less than uh, H0 in this region. So this is the sort of the nice, the nice region where H is less than H0. And then you have a region where maybe you have sort of such a neck. And then it may open up again to give you a nice region. So here you have another nice region. And in here, to use red, and here somewhere is the red. This is the region where <coughs> H is bigger than H0. And there may be also sort of bad regions which look like these cylindrical regions, but they end in this convex cap. And there may be, if the surface is disconnected, there may also be a region where you have a tiny shrinking sphere, and you may also have a region where sort of a cylindrical 
region of high curvature closes up in two caps. And you may even have the situation where such a cylindrical region closes up in itself and you have sort of a shrinking circle. But the point is that in all these regions where h is bigger than h0, the rescaling of this region satisfies theorem 1. You see either the shrinking, you are either shrinking, you are either, either the rescaling under the microscope, this region looks like a cylinder or a cap or such, <coughs> yes. And you can make this quantitative. Yeah, so I can choose this H0. <coughs> so this is part of the theorem. It's a quantitative theorem. Given epsilon bigger than zero and lambda less than infinity, so this is <coughs> how close you are to <coughs> the picture of the previous theorem, or in particular how close you are to a cylinder of length, how close you are to a cylinder of length lambda <coughs> in a huge norm. You can even prescribe the norm in C1 over epsilon <coughs> after rescaling. Right. Given epsilon, you can fix the H0. So in other words, we can even introduce these parameters to make, these, to make this quantitative. This will th depend on the epsilon and it will depend on the lambda. We have a very quantitative theorem that tells you, you tell me how precisely you want to see these singularities. And I tell you how long you have to wait with your curvature, how huge the curvature have to be that you have that control in the red region. Okay. So that's a very <coughs> quantitative, precise description of the singularities, and that's what enables you to <coughs> do the surgery and restart the flow, something Carlo will tell you more about. Now let me give you at least some ideas of uh, how we can fit our previous results together to prove this theorem, what goes in. So the ingredients of proof First of all, the, of course, the uh, convexity estimate goes in to restrict you very much. Then you use the non-collapsing estimate. Of course, this implies that it remains embedded, but it remains embedded in a quantitative way. <clears throat> the non-collapsing estimate says that after rescaling, if, <clears throat> right, so, so non-collapsing, you have to combine these two. How? So in the third step, you, you, you write down these two results, and then you do the rescaling. And then these two estimates, one and two, so first, yeah, let's do it in two steps. One, in play, one sees that you get either strictly convex <coughs> or you get weakly convex. Now, if, it, if you get something which is weakly convex, you can see by the strong maximum principle, the rescaling actually, if, it is, if the rescaling is giving something which is only weakly convex, has to be weakly convex everywhere. 
And if it is weakly convex everywhere, the smallest eigenvalue, one of the two eigenvalues, has to be zero everywhere. But if it is zero everywhere, you can see that you can integrate that direction for Benio's theorem. And therefore, it, the surface has to contain a line. So if it is weakly convex, yeah, maybe I do the, sorry, maybe I do the weakly convex case first. So weakly convex, this implies the rescaled surface <coughs> is some gamma of t cross r. It must contain a line. And gamma t solves mean curvature flow. And mean curvature flow turns into curve shortening flow. Curve shortening flow in the plane perpendicular to the line. But then you use, in particular here, in the non-collapsing estimate, the, there's the improved non-collapsing non -collapsing estimate by Brentle. So here the <coughs> improved non-collapsing estimate, remember, showed the, the <coughs> inscribed radius after rescaling is less than the mean curvature. That was the last result I showed yesterday, I think. After rescaling, because of this improved non-collapsing estimate by Brentle, <coughs> mean curvature <coughs> dominates mu, but this means if we are, this must mean on gamma, must mean that the inscribed radius is bigger than 1 over the geodesic curvature. But this must mean gamma is a shrinking circle. Gamma is a shrinking circle. And that proves that if we are in the weakly convex case, we get that this gamma t cross r is in fact S1 cross r just a shrinking cylinder. So the weakly convex case is just the shrinking cylinder we see. Now the other possibility is that the limit is <coughs> strictly convex. Now if, this, if the limit is strictly convex, there's two possibilities. It might close up. It may be, if it's uniformly convex, then an argument similar to Meyer's theorem. Meyer's theorem is not quite enough to do it, actually. You have to work harder. But sort of think of Meyer's theorem. If it was uniformly convex all the time, you expect it to close up. And using our gradient estimates and everything else we know, we can replace Meyer's theorem to show that. So either it closes up because it's uniformly convex. The ratio, the principal curvatures is bounded below. But then we, are, then we are in the case of S2. And that's one of the, that's the first case in the theorem. Right? We have identified the second case in the theorem. We've identified the first case in the theorem, S2. Or the other possibility is it does not close up. But the only possibility that happens if it does not close up, it cannot be uniformly convex all the time. It cannot be uniformly convex all the time. <coughs> With Lambda i, the, the smallest principal curvature, lambda 1, divided by h, tending to 0 along some sequence of points tending to infinity. Right? If this wasn't, wouldn't go down to 0, it has to close up. But if this goes to zero, then we can rescale again around these points. 
And then we get back into this situation. Can rescale again there. When I say rescale again there, this is an important point. You see, I'm now very, since I'm going out, I'm going away from, you know, I'm, I found this strictly convex thing. Now I have to prove that there's a cylinder at the end. So I have to take points. Here's my sequence of points. They go out to infinity. These points are far away from the point where the maximum of the curvature is attained. So if I do the rescaling and I don't have a gradient estimate, I don't get a limit. So the limiting procedure requires the gradient estimate. And if I just have the simple gradient estimate that controls the gradient of the curvature in terms of the maximum curvature, it's not good enough to rescale here. So that's where I, <coughs> I use the Hasselhofer Kleiner estimate. Remember, gradient A <coughs> less than a constant times A squared. <coughs> I don't write down all the conditions, but there was this interior estimate depending on the non-collapsing estimate. Hasselhofer Kleiner had the interior gradient estimate because they had the non-collapsing estimate. Not, they didn't need the improvement by Brantley, but the non-collapsing estimate gave you this. This allows me to rescale at points that are far away from the maximum. And then, because this tends to zero, I'm back in the case, get the cylinder again. Right, I get, I get a point where lambda 1 must be 0 in the limit, but then by the strong maximum principle must be 0 everywhere, and then by the improved estimate of Bentley, it must be uh, again after rescaling as 1 cross r. So this is the third possibility, that I find something first which is strictly convex, but then I can go along this strictly convex thing and I can find a cylinder after rescaling again near infinity. So this is a sketch of the first proof of the first theorem. And then you have to do this all quantitatively and using the fact that you can rescale everywhere, you can create this picture easily. So the key thing is the theorem over there and the fact that we are able to rescale everywhere and then we can show that unless we are in the region where the curvature is not so big, we can <coughs> uh, rescale wherever we want and <coughs> we get this thing. It's all contradiction arguments to some extent. It's all contradiction arguments, but given the epsilon, um, we uh, produce uh, this number H0. And then we have a quantitative control and uh, can uh, do the surgery procedure, uh, which I'm not uh, explain, going to explain in detail now. Rather, I'd like to show you a little bit what can then be done. So the theorem that eventually follows from this with surgery procedure. So the surgery procedure is the thing that either cuts off this piece, all right, so the surgery, I'm just doing it schematically. It would just cut off here, and it would cut off there, and it would throw away this piece, because we know what it is, right? We know it's a tiny, arbitrarily tiny um, <coughs> tube around some curve. We know what this is, topologically, it's an S2, and we know what this is, and this one we could off, cut off, we would cut off with another surgery here. Okay, so we, in this picture, 
we would do three surgeries, one here, one there, one there, and throw away the pieces that we know. And this procedure improves the isoparametric behavior of the surface. And I claim now the theorem says that Again, Simon, using strongly <coughs> the surgery uh, procedure that Carlo and I developed in the higher dimensional case, <coughs> we can show that given any initial surface, two-dimensional surface, in the Riemannian three-manifold, embedded h greater than zero. And uh, let's assume the Riemannian three-manifold is uh, compact. It's sufficient if it is what they say mean convex near infinity that the surface cannot escape at infinity. So given any such smooth initial surface, there is a solution of mean curvature flow interrupted by finitely many surgeries at scales at a scale are zero radius that you cut off uh, comparable to this constant h0 to the minus 1. <coughs> Such that Either the area of M and T tends to zero as uh, T tends to some T max, which is finite. Here, when I say M and T, M and T may consist of uh, <coughs> finitely many. disconnected components, right? Even if I start with something which is connected, already after the first surgery, when I cut off this neck here, I may have two disconnected components. So when I write M and T, I mean the union of all the pieces that are still there and that I haven't thrown away. So either the area goes to zero uh, <coughs> in a finite time, or what else could happen? Well, in the general three manifold, the thing could just get stuck on a minimal surface, right? Or MNT is smooth, or MNT exists on zero infinity. And uh, there exists some time T1, bigger than and a finite T1, such that M and T smooth. So no more surgeries after T1. And then M and I always write MN. This is a two surface, okay? And uh, M2T converges smoothly to a smooth, weakly stable minimal surface. 
I draw some pictures in a, in a second. To make this table. Examples and remarks. So first of all, if you are in R3, <coughs> always T max is less than infinity. Because even a complicated surface can be enclosed by some sphere, which dies in finite time. So certainly, the area will, go, will all go away in finite time. So in the Euclidean case, you can just have finitely many such surgeries, and the thing decomposes into uh, these pieces. By the way, you can easily write down initial data um, of positive mean curvature, take a thin, a thin, very thin circle, axially symmetric, and then you get this picture here, right? That you can have, in fact, in R3, a torus, a very thin torus, and if it is completely symmetric, it will shrink to a circle. Yeah? So you can, have, you can have this picture in R3. Now, <coughs> in a Riemannian manifold, things <coughs> are Many things can happen. So, for example, if the Riemannian manifold looks like this, right? if this is N3 G bar, and your initial surface, let's see which color do I use? Let's use yellow for the initial surface. So if the initial surface is something like this, then the mean curvature vector points in this direction. And, you know, it will just smoothly, smoothly and slowly converge to this minimal surface in here. So this is Mn infinity. And this is Mn zero. Right? Nothing happens. No singularity, nothing. No surgery. It just completely smoothly goes to the uh, minimal surface in there, and that's stable. In fact, it could be weakly stable if I had attached a cylinder here, along here, then it would just be a weakly stable minimal surface. Okay? Now, if I draw the picture slightly different, if I draw it like this, and there is no such sink in there, then in this case, I guess, if there's no serious things happening in between, the solution will just keep going, keep going, and end up here, the point, just like the convex solutions in Euclidean space. Now, let's make the three manifold more complicated. Suppose there's some topology here. Well, then if the surface starts moving, something has to go wrong, right? And, uh, well, what goes wrong is that at some stage here, you have sort of, yeah, I should use, yeah, maybe I use white or orange. Yeah. You have a surgery time here because you have developed somewhere a neck here. You do the surgery here, and then the surface is continue, you have two pieces, one piece here and one piece there. And now, depending on the topology, this could converge to two separate minimal surfaces. Ah, I wanted to use red for the limit. Okay, so this could be 
the m to infinity. And yeah, it's number two. Okay. So this can happen. Breaks up, goes into two. And you know, you <coughs> of course I could have, you know, put some tentacle here, then you could have one piece being stuck on a minimal surface. This keeps going, and the, the other piece could contract to a point, would also be possible. And uh, one other piece is important that to, to notice that, um, yeah, let, let's do a, let's do a um, application to general relativity. So, so in general relativity, you have these three manifolds which have stars, here's a star, and this is some n3 g bar, where here near infinity it looks like r3, it's asymptotically flat, and you should think of this sitting in some Lorentzian four manifold, and it's a space-like slice, and here you have a black hole. So this is a horizon, sigma 2 h. And in the simplest case, the mean curvature of a horizon is 0 in this 3 manifold. And here you have some star, which means a region of positive scalar curvature. And then you can do the following with this theorem. You could start with some huge sphere near infinity. So m to 0 is the boundary of some huge sphere around the origin in this asymptotically flat region. And then you let it flow. And then at some stage, there's my orange here, at some stage, a surgery will be necessary because it reaches this point. And then after the surgery, these guys here will contract in finite time to this point. And these other guys will take infinite time until they reach the, this horizon. So you can use mean curvature flow to sweep out asymptotically flat three manifolds, the exterior region. So <coughs> mean curvature flow can sweep out the asymptotically flat region of <coughs> an asymptotically of a, of a space-like slice. of a Lorentzian manifold which models an isolated gravitating system. I should make one remark, I should give credit that I didn't do that yet, examples, remarks, and one remark that I didn't make for this um, uh, long-term existence, that for some time, for some finite time, after that everything is smooth and no more singularity can happen, for this part we <coughs> use ideas from Brian White. You see, Brian White has pushed another concept of weak solutions, the level set approach, to sort of its limit. And uh, he's shown that 
in this situation, you can also have level set solutions. It doesn't have quite as much control on the singularities. It just has an estimate on the uh, Hausdorff dimension of the singular set. But he can also prove that his weak solution is going to be smooth uh, near the final minimal surface. And we prove our result by proving that our solution, after a long time, is very close to Brian White's solution. And that's how we get our smoothness for a long time. Yeah, so we should give a lot of credit here to Brian White. Right, so, so and notice the, the theorem here doesn't assume any assumption on the curvature of the three manifold, right? So <coughs> the, um, for example, here it is known in general relativity that you would like to consider three manifolds uh, with uh, non-negative scalar curvature. But for this result that you uh, can start near infinity and you move until you find the outermost um, minimal surface, um, you don't need the non-negative scalar curvature. If you have the non-negative scalar curvature, you can conclude that this limiting surface must be a two-sphere and not a, um, a torus or a higher genus surface, right? So, so only at that last step where you show that the horizon actually is a two-sphere in this low-dimensional case, you would use an energy assumption on the Lorentzian manifold or so. But here, this is completely general. Um, but what we can say is, since we're always cutting necks, in other words, we're reducing genus, what we can say is that the genus of this limiting minimal surface, so the genus of Fm2 infinity, is certainly less than the genus of the initial surface. It's not so easy, you, you, cannot, you cannot, what you cannot do is argue that each time you do a surgery, you reduce the genus, right? Because sometimes you might cut off a trivial sphere, right? If you have a neck here, and you just cut off this sphere, it doesn't change the topology. So just looking at how much surgery you had to do doesn't tell you how much the genus has dropped. But you know that the genus will never go up. Ah, right, and I want to give you one more example that can happen. You know, this three manifold could have one of these uh, things that you need in spaceship enterprise. Right, there is a, you could have a three manifold that looks like this. And uh, it has sort of this bridge here allows you to go from one part of the universe to the other part of the universe. And then, of course, your initial surface has to do some more surgery here. And then the surfaces would move in here and there and there. And it could happen that there is just one minimal surface in this whole bridge. And then these minimal surfaces, you would have two pieces, two, two separate pieces of your solution which approach the same minimal surface inside the three manifold from two different sides. Right? This can also happen. But this is the worst that can happen. Because there's again a theorem of Brian White that you cannot have, this would contradict essentially the monotonicity formula, density formula, that you cannot have three solutions of mean curvature flow coming arbitrarily close if they are embedded. Yeah? Uh, sorry, two, more, more than three. You can have at most three. One from the left, one from the right, and the minimal surface in the middle. You cannot have more than three. That's a result of Brian White. Very general result for minimal surfaces and solutions of mean curvature flow if they are embedded. And you see, it can happen. Yeah? So for the physicists, of course, they would separate the thing here and treat it as two different ends as seen from infinity. Okay. Now, last few minutes, what does this have to do with isoparametric? What can you do about isoparametric inequalities now? Well, <coughs> turns out you can now 
uh, try to use this technique, for example, in such asymptotically flat three manifolds and say something about the isoparametric behavior of these asymptotically flat three manifolds. And uh, <clears throat> those of you who know these things in general relativity, there's a concept of mass for this asymptotically flat three manifold. It sort of measures how, uh, <coughs> how big the stuff inside is. So there's this famous positive mass theorem if this three manifold N3 G bar has scalar curvature of G bar greater or equal to zero and the thing is asymptotically flat then the mass due to Anovit, Desa, and Misner of this three manifold is defined by the physicists as some constant by <coughs> the sphere, the two sphere near infinity, so we take huge spheres near infinity of some derivatives of the metric dgij, dxj minus dgii, dxj um, <clears throat> times the normal near inf d, d sigma. Think, think of this like a Newtonian, a flux integral, like the metric is the Newtonian potential and this is a normal integral over the normal derivative of the uh, potential. This, you know, in Newtonian mechanics, this would give you the mass, the manifold. Turns out this flux integral near infinity is under suitable decay estimates of this metric to the Euclidean metric is a, a geometric invariant and replaces the Newton flux integral. And uh, the positive mass theorem that this thing says that if the scalar curvature is greater or equal to zero, this thing is non-negative non with equality if and only if um, N3 G bar is equal to R3 with the standard metric, and this positive mass theorem is due to Shane and Yao, around 79. And you see this flux integral, you, at first you don't see that it is independent of the coordinate system. <coughs> and there's a lot of work to be done, and it uses first derivatives of the metric, so it's uh, not a nice quantity to work with. And <coughs> Positive mass theorem is very, not, very hard to prove, actually, using minimal surface theory and so on. It turns out you can prove this theorem using inverse mean curvature flow, and you can do more using mean curvature flow if you combine inverse mean curvature flow, which Toti uh, talked about, and mean curvature flow. Then you get an isoparametric control on very large regions. Remember, Toti said, said something about uh, certain integrals being monotone and so on. You can use the inverse mean curvature flow to get a lower bound on integral h squared, integral of the mean curvature squared, on any outward minimizing surface in the three manifold. And that was the key step, remember, at the beginning of this lecture when I proved the isoparametric inequality in R3 for convex surfaces, the key point was to have a good lower bound on integral h squared. Now, it turns out you can use inverse mean curvature flow on each of these slices that you get from mean curvature flow. Right? So we, we take mean curvature flow starting at the big yellow surface near infinity, and we flow inwards. On each of these surfaces coming from mean curvature flow, I can use inverse mean curvature flow to get a lower bound on integral of the mean curvature squared. And then I use that lower bound to prove an isoparametric inequality. And that isoparametric inequality, in the end, turns out to characterize the mass. So the theorem I want to f finish with is um, that you can <coughs> characterize the mass of such a three manifold as the isoparametric deficit. So you take the uh, <coughs> limb soup of 
domains, of the boundaries of domains tending to infinity. So take larger and larger domains. And then you take the extra volume that you can put in compared to the Euclidean thing. In the Euclidean thing, we have the isoparametric inequality would say that the area of the boundary to the 3 over 2 is always bigger than 6 square root of pi times the volume. So in Euclidean space, this would almost be negative. But if you are in this manifolds, and the mass, is, the mass is positive. If the mass is positive, you can do better. And uh, you just have to rescale the things. You have to put a 2 here and divide by the area, because mass scales like area. So you have to put in the right scaling. But then you get this thing. You can characterize the mass by how much the manifold differs isoparametrically from Euclidean space. And uh, this is the one result that I could explain what I'm doing to my teenage children. I said, uh, if you have a trampoline, then if it's flat, nobody on the trampoline, then the isoparametric inequality tells you that with a rope of length 2 pi, you can bound an area equal to pi. But if you, my child, stand on the trampoline, you have this dent. And then there's some mass on the trampoline. And then, because of this dent, with the same rope, you can bound more area as just pi. And if I'm standing on the trampoline, it may get a black hole, but, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, you can get more area. And it is exactly the same thing in general relativity, right? If you have a heavy star bending the three-manifold that slices through space-time, then you can put more volume into the same area than you can do in Euclidean space. And you can, in fact, use the isoparametric defect. How much more volume you can put is an exact measure for the mass um, in uh, general relativity. And I think that's a good, plus, good point to stop. <laughs>